Well, will you turn with me, please, to that psalm that we read, Psalm 11. Psalm 11. And I want to draw your attention well, to the whole psalm in due course, but we shall begin with verse 3. Psalm 11, verse 3. Here we read these words, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And if you wanted a title for today's study, it would be this. It would be Trusting God when the foundations are destroyed. Now this verse describes a situation where the foundations of society are destroyed. The, the, the picture here is of a building. And uh, the picture here is of a building which is severely damaged. But as we look at this building, it's not just a few roof tiles that have been knocked off the top. It's not a window that's been knocked in or even a wall that's been caved in. No, it is the foundations themselves that have been destroyed. Now, if you lose a few roof tiles, if you have a window that's broken, we can mend that fairly straight, straightforward. Uh, but if the foundations of a building are destroyed, well, then the whole structure of the building is in danger and it's near to being pulled down and rebuilt. We thank God that the foundation of our faith cannot be moved. The foundation of our faith is firm and ever stands firm. God ultimately is the foundation of our faith. If you can challenge omnipotence, then you can shake the foundation of our faith. If you can be wiser than God and outsmart God, then you can shake the foundations of our faith. We read, do we not? In um, the book of Romans, there's lovely last verses in Romans chapter 8. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are in the hand of of Almighty God, and as our Saviour said of his Father, none can pluck them from his hand. He is greater than all. So we thank God that the foundations of our faith cannot be destroyed. We thank God that the word of God can never be overturned. We build our faith not only on the person of God himself, but on the spoken word of God and everything that he has written in this book, and supremely the Saviour whom it reveals. And we thank thee that Christ's work is an everlasting work and that nothing can detract from it. Nothing can undo the work of the almighty Saviour who has wrought atonement for us. We thank thee that if this book, our Saviour said, that though heaven and earth pass away, my words shall never pass away. So Christ himself his salvation, none of these things can in any way be touched or challenged or removed. But it is a sad truth that other foundations can be destroyed. There are local churches that close. A local church is not exempt from closure. We have that wonderful verse, verse do we? Uh, on this rock, I will build my church. Christ there is speaking about the global church. He's building his church. But you go up and down this land and you will see church buildings that have been closed, that have been converted into um, private residences or community centers or things like that. And you, you, you are very saddened when you see such a thing. Local churches are not exempt from having their foundations destroyed. Well, let's be clear about it. Their foundations have not been destroyed. The problem is that they've moved off their foundation. The foundation still stands firm. The foundation of the Bible and of Christ and of his word. 
but churches move off of it and move into some other place and then they are exposed and vulnerable unless they return to their sound basis. Marriages, marriages, if their foundation is the mutual love of a man and a woman, well, that's a very wonderful thing. And so often it is sound and sincere and lasts and endures and it's a marvellous aspect of human life and social life. But men and women are fallible and human love is not impervious to destruction and to being changed and perverted and altered. And we hear of many divorces and things like that. Of course, things are stronger, much stronger, when Christ is present in the marriage. A threefold cord is not easily broken, but even that can sometimes be broken. So we have the difficult situation in our land of marriages breaking up. The foundations that we, that we are so important to us can be shaken and can be destroyed. But here, it's generally agreed amongst the commentators that this verse is dealing with society. This verse is dealing with a society whose foundations are breaking up. Um, the foundations, the principles that undergird a stable society, things like truth and justice and respect for the rule of law. I'm going to put those down. Truth, justice, and respect for the rule of law. You could probably add to those to that list. In uh, Isaiah, in chapter 59, we have a description. Now, of course, in Isaiah's day, the foundation was a theocracy. The, the, the state was a theocracy. I'm not speaking here about a theocracy, a state which God has established. There was only one of those, and that was Israel. I'm talking about... The, the, the secular society in which we live, we can still have a society which is based upon respect for truth, respect for law, respect for justice, and the rule of law. But Isaiah, in, in chapter 59, speaks uh, of these things. He says in verse 13, In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Justice is far away, and the un there is injustice perpetrated against the poor and the weak, and truth is fallen in the street. People don't know what is true and what is false, and there is no real understanding of absolute truth anymore. And things that are false are called true, and things that are true are called false. And in the midst of it all, law and order is disdained and is uh, disrespected, and the rule of the magistrate and the police is uh, uh, fought against. Well, this is what this verse is speaking about, the foundations being destroyed. Well, this verse has been much on my mind this week. I don't know, I'm speaking to those here who've been Christians for a good while, there are probably verses from the Bible that are very, I wouldn't say necessarily dear to you, but have been often stuck in your mind. Verses that are, you, you, your mind would turn to from time to time. Well, this is a verse that all through my Christian life, for some reason or other, has been in my mind. The great preciousness that we have of a strong and a stable society, even though it's imperfect, yet a society that is based upon good foundations. Well, you look back over what's happened over the past week or so, and we have to say what is happening. Is the foundation of society being overthrown? Well, we can't tell. I, I, I'm not here really to cast comment upon politics or, or social, what's happening at the moment. I want to speak from the scripture. And starting at this point, because it is something that's been in, in my mind and perhaps it's been in your mind, the foundations of society. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And this verse does make us understand the fragi fragility of society and the, the, the fact that these things are, are, are not permanent. 
things can change. There have been societies where there have been revolutions and things have been overturned and terrible things have happened. And this verse is very pessimistic. It's not a very hopeful verse, is it? If the foundations be destroyed, if the foundations of society are destroyed, well, what can the righteous do about it? These things are so big and so powerful and so far above us and we're tiny little cogs in a big wheel. What can the righteous do? And that's the view that I have taken of this verse. But as I turned to it again this week, I came to see that I totally misunderstood it. And I wonder if there's anybody here who has looked at this verse or perhaps other thoughts have come into your mind and you found yourself despairing a little. Uh, you found yourself wondering, well, what on earth can we do when everything seems to be falling apart around us? Perhaps it's on a stable footing now, I don't know. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It does seem to be a despairing verse, a situation of hopelessness and helplessness. Well, that's what the Bible says. The Bible actually says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Is there any positive note that we can read into this psalm? Is there anything that is really helpful and encouraging to us in the midst of something that seems so depressing? Well, the answer is yes, there is. And there's a reason for that. In this psalm, there are two voices speaking. In this psalm, there is the voice of trust and courage, and there is the voice of um, unbelief and helplessness. This is the voice of unbelief and helplessness, but there's another voice speaking throughout this psalm. And I want us to look at that other voice and see how this second voice of unbelief and despair arises in the midst of it. So let's look at this voice these, these two voices. And to do that, let's begin at the beginning and let's go through the psalm. Let's take it in order and you'll see how we exegete this psalm, I trust. First of all, in the title, it's a psalm of David. So David wrote this psalm to the chief musician. So this is a psalm that is to be sung, to be sung in the temple worship. This is a psalm that is to be borne in mind, to be rehearsed, to be set before us. There are great truths for us in this psalm. It is a psalm of David. Now, as all of the psalms of David, this was written in a particular historical setting. Now, some psalms tell us exactly what was happening when David wrote it. This one doesn't, but it gives us some very strong hints. Look at verse 2. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. This is a day when David and his righteous colleagues were being persecuted, being persecuted secretly. There is the suggestion in verse 1, flee as a bird to your mountain, run away, David. Things have got so bad, foundations are being destroyed, run away as a bird to your mountain. Flee from these things. This is a situation when the society, the social fabric of the land, uh, was greatly disturbed. And we say, well, when in David's reign fits that description. And there are two obvious possibilities. One is before David ever became king, when he was persecuted by Saul and fled into the wilderness. The second is later in David's reign, under Absalom, when there was that revolution, that rebellion under Absalom, and David again had to flee and run away, and Absalom took the reins of power for a while until God restored David. Now, we don't know which of those two it may be. It's interesting if you just turn back to Psalm 3. <coughs> Psalm 3 reads like this. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So we have a, a clear historical background for this. And in verses 1 and 2, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Well, that very closely fits what is being said 
in this Psalm 11, there is no help for him in God. But we can't be sure. It could be the persecution under Saul, or it could be under the persecution um, under Absalom. Anyway, whichever it is, his life is in danger, and um, verse 3 seems in that case to be a description of the age. The social fabric really does seem to be under dire threat. Verse 1. In the Lord put I my strength. Note how the psalm begins. The psalm begins with a strong affirmation of trust in God from David's heart. This is not a psalm that begins with despair and discouragement. This is a psalm which begins with David declaring strongly, courageously, his trust in the Lord. In the Lord put I my trust. It's not just in the Lord I trust, in the Lord put I my trust. The word used here is of fleeing to a tower, fleeing to a refuge. David is running to the Lord and he is consciously trusting and resting in God to care for him and to watch over him. And he declares it, he has absolute confidence in the Lord. In the Lord put I my trust. If I could put it another way, whatever my eye perceives in this realm whatever I see going on around my throne and in the nation around about me nevertheless I have a spiritual eye that lifts up to God in heaven above and I set my eye on him and I see there everything that I need to give me peace confidence and courage and as I've said David is not ashamed because he is in dialogue if you look at verse 1 in the Lord put I my trust how say ye to my soul so there are people who are speaking to him and this is really a response to what they have said they have spoken to him how say ye to my soul flee as a bird to your mountain there are those who have said to david run away escape flee flee as a harried bird runs off into the wilderness to a mountain somewhere to escape and there are those who have said to David flee as a bird to your mountain and David answers them and he says no I've placed my trust in the Lord you may remember in Nehemiah Nehemiah was encouraged to do something like the same encouraged to flee and he said how shall a man like I flee and David is saying something very much the same. In the Lord put I my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountain? Now, let's just take stock. So here we have David, a ruler over the land, if it's Absalom's time to be ruler in, in Saul's day. And then there are those who are encouraging him to flee. Now, it seems to us that these don't seem to be the enemies of David they seem to be the friends of David who are giving this advice if you look at verse 2 for lo the wicked bend their bow this is the description the wicked bend their bow and this verse 2 is a continuation of what his had been said in verse 1 the words of these people who are encouraging him to flee, they go like this. They go, flee as a bird to your mountain, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Here is their counsel to David, flee as a bird to the mountain. Here is the reason. They say, look, the unrighteous are bending their bow. I don't know how many of you, maybe on your camp you've just had, you did so much, I don't know. But when you string a bow, you bend the bow and you put the, the bowstring upon the bent bow. This is a picture of them getting ready their weapons to fire at the, at the righteous. And then they get the arrow and the arrow is carefully fitted upon the bowstring. And then that they might privily shoot at the upright in heart. They're doing this in secret. They're doing this privately. So David's danger is even greater because he's not going to see the arrow when it comes whizzing through the air towards him. This is the situation. This is going on. The wicked are planning against David and these counsellors, these advisors of David, say to him, flee. Look, the wicked are doing these things. Now, it's most unlikely that those words would be used by the wicked. For lo, the wicked 
bend their bow. The wicked wouldn't say that. The wicked wouldn't give that advice. So the most likely situation is that this is David's friends, those who are close to David, David's colleagues, who are actually giving this word to him. And this is a temptation. And temptations come to us in this life. Trials come to us in this life. Testing times come to us in this life. Will we follow the scripture or will we turn away from the scripture? Will we stand in the position where God has placed us? Will we hold firm to the things that we believe and that we practice? Or will we desert our post and run away? And this is a test. This is false counsel being given to David and false counsel will come to us and sometimes it will come to us from Christians. Sometimes there are well-meaning Christians who will speak to us words that are unreliable and that we need to turn our back on and we say, no, that's not right. We need to stand up. It's a, a great danger when temptations come to you. And they, Eve was the tempter of, of Adam, wasn't she? When testings and temptations come to us from those that we have our trust in and, and that we love and that we respect. So here we are. These people have been called David's timid friends because these people are timid. They're not willing to take the stand that David did. They're, they're, they're afraid and they're fearful of what is about to come. And so they offer David this counsel, flee as a bird to your mountain. And David responds and said, no, my trust is in the Lord. I will not flee. I will stand where the Lord has put me. And then verse 3. How do we interpret verse 3? Well, surely it's a continuation of verse 2. It's a continuation of this timid counsel. Flee as a bird to your mountain, David's friends say. For lo, the wicked bend their bow and make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do, say David's timid friends to him? Look at, look at the situation. Absalom is already in power. He's coming up with his many counsellors. He's got a vast army. The foundations of society are being destroyed. David, what are you to do? Flee as a bird to the mountains. Escape abscond, resign from the kingship, abdicate, uh, give up. Well, we know that David did have to run away. He says here, in the Lord I put my trust. Sometimes we have to escape difficult situations. This is not saying that if you're in a life and death situation, you have to stay there. No, we know that Paul escaped from Damascus through a basket lowered down through the window. We know that, uh, know that on two situations, David did have to flee for his life. We know that our saviour no longer walked in Jewry because of the threat to him there. And he walked uh, away from Judea for a little while. He withdrew because of the threats that were being made against him. So we have good precedent. If we need to escape because we are in a very dangerous situation, then we can run. It's it's a legitimate line of attack, uh, of, sorry, line of attack, uh, defence. But that's different from throwing in the towel. That's different from going away when there's no real danger. That's different from running because you're afraid and because you're scared and because you're not willing to stand where God has put you when there's no real danger to your person and you can have the influence amongst perhaps your ungodly friends or the church or or stand where the Lord has put you. So David puts his trust in the Lord and he sees what is being counseled against him, not as mere escape for escape as others have done, just a sort of tactical withdrawal to, to keep alive. No, this is a call to run away, David. Run away from the kingship to which God has appointed you. If the foundations be destroyed, his friends and his counsellors say... Um, uh, then, then, um, then what can the righteous do run? So these were severe trials for David. He says, how say ye to my soul? This caused him spiritual difficulty. He wrestled with this. He was tried <coughs> and tested, but he came through. And he was able to powerfully declare his, uh, his faith in the Lord. So... From verse 4 onwards, David picks up 
and we're no longer listening to the timid friends. We're listening now to those who are strong in the Lord and have courage. But let's just pause for a moment on verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is the voice of timidity. That's the voice of um, uh, fleeing. That's the voice of unbelief. What does the voice of faith say? The voice of faith says, what cannot the righteous do? Is there nothing that we cannot achieve with faith in God? That's what the voice of faith says. Turn to Hebrews 11, that wonderful chapter. Hebrews 11 really is the biblical answer to these timid friends in, uh, Hebrew, in uh, Psalm 11. Hebrews chapter 11, these great examples of faith. One person often left alone in a society and yet having such influence by their faith. Verse 7, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, <coughs> which is by faith. One man well, with his household against the whole world around him at the time, that one man was found to be the, in the right place, the right one. Abraham, in verse 8, he uh, he went out in verse 9 by faith he sojourned in the land of promise you see he didn't obtain the promise but he saw it afar off that's what we read verse 10 he looked for a city which hath foundations Sarah in verse 11 through faith she received strength to conceive seed and of course that seed would be the uh, uh, in the line of the Messiah if you drop down to verse 13 these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This is the life of faith, not standing not need at what goes on around us, but trusting the Lord. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Make no mistake, it may be unpleasant. Standing for the Lord may be unpleasant. We read some of, in, in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, did we not? Some of the things that the Apostle Paul had to endure. Persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured and so forth. No doubt there may be dreadful persecutions in store for God's people. But by faith, God's people can be conquerors and endure them and not listen to the voices of timidity that sometimes come to us. Go down in Hebrews 11 to these lovely final verses where the apostle brings together a whole raft of, of different testimonies. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, uh, turned to flight, sorry, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens and so forth. This is faith. This is what faith can achieve. This is what faith can bring to pass. So in Psalm 11, there are two voices. We must recognize the voice of despair and hopelessness and we must question it. And we may say, why are you saying these things to me? We must be strong and we must, just as David does say things like, is there not a God in heaven? Is there not a God who looks after the righteous? How can you say such things? Well, let's quickly go through the final verses of Psalm 11 to see David's response. The Lord, he says in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Here is the Lord God Almighty as king king over the universe 
in his holy temple in heaven, far above this world that is in such uproar and his purposes are unchanged. It is a holy temple. Perhaps the word holy contrasts the word, to the, the word wicked in verse 2. Yes, society may be full of wickedness, but the one who rules is holy and is in, in, uh, in, in his temple. One of the commentaries, I, I, I didn't write down this, this quote, but I thought it was a very good one. I wish I had written it down. It says that the, it gives this picture of the foundations of the, the various different cities and build, buildings buckling and changing. But he says, but underneath is the granite bedrock. And there is God. There is his rule. The granite bedrock undergirding this world. Do we not read in Hebrews chapter 1 of Christ up? holding all things by the word of his power. The whole universe, every society on earth, every city on earth, every family on earth is upheld by the mighty power of Jesus Christ. He has his hands under the whole... It's the old song, he has the whole world in his hands. Well, he does have the whole world in his hands. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Those people who riot, those people who... Uh, lambast our dear saviour and mock him uh, they only take their very next breath because jesus christ grants it to them so here we have the lord as king of the universe he says there in verse four his eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men well that contrasts with verse two as well does it not here are the wicked planning and scheming privately that they may privately, privately there shoot at the upright in heart, but they're not hidden from God. God's, he says there in verse 4, his eyes behold, he sees everything in the darkest closet, in the deepest depths of a person's imagination and mind, the Lord God sees it all, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men, the Lord trieth the righteous, well, we're moving on from the Lord reigning and being the, 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 the king of the earth to now the Lord being the judge of all the earth. There is righteousness on the throne of God. The unrighteous may think that they hold the reins of this land and scheme to increase even further the unrighteousness all around us. But the one who is really on the throne is absolutely and utterly righteous and he sees all these things. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. He beholds them and he tries them. We see trials referred to in verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous. These circumstances that come upon us are brought upon us under the controlling will of God. God permits them. We do not always see the reasons why things happen. We do not always see the reasons why these things occur. But nevertheless, they come by the sovereign permission of God. And God can work multiple things by his permission, by his trials that he brings upon us. It's been said that, using the illustration of a, of a, a bow and arrow again, God can fire an arrow and hit three targets at the same time. So God can send these trials and at the same time they're going to teach lessons to the ungodly. They're going to learn perhaps that they don't have all the answers. The ungodly in authority are going to see that really they're powerless to control uh, certain things. Those who think themselves without any ruler over them. It says there in the next Psalm, Psalm 12 and verse 4, who is Lord over us? People say, who is Lord over us? Well, perhaps people have to have their nose rubbed in the dirt a little bit to show them that there really is somebody on the throne of God. Maybe society might come to see that it doesn't have all the answers and it might regret so all this casting aside of Christianity and the gospel. Who knows what God might work? All these things, very disturbing. We don't know why they are happening. They're not given to us to know. Jerusalem was overthrown, but the people were taken away to Babylon and after 70 years returned to the promised land. God does great and wonderful things, overturns nations, but he has his own purposes behind it. 
But amongst all those things, there is a separate purpose for the godly. And that purpose is described in verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous. So in all of these things, God's true people are being exercised. They are being tried. The word used is of uh, um, metal being heated in a crucible and tested by the, 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 uh, the blacksmith or whoever it might be, the metallurgist. And uh, the Lord tries us. The Lord burns off the dross. The Lord tests us to see what we are made of and to strengthen us, much like you might get an athlete and you put him through difficult trials in order to build up his muscle mass or her bus- muscle mass or so, so, so forth. So we see and understand then that in all these things, God is exercising the righteous for good, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. One day, not necessarily immediately, because God is a God of great patience. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. So what can the righteous do? Well, the first thing that we must do is we must bear this in mind. We must remember that God is sovereign and that underneath are the everlasting arms. We must deliberately place our trust in him. We must not be afraid to proclaim that. And if there are those around us who are timorous and weak and a little bit scared, we must lift up their arms. A church, the apostle says, is a place where we lift up one another's arms, where we encourage one another in the things of the faith. We must hold these things firm. We must have the right mental outlook upon things. We must not expect this world to be a place through which we will pass unharmed and unscathed and without any suffering at all. No, this is a place of trial and difficulty. Um, what is it again that we read in uh, in uh, First Timothy in uh, First Timothy chapter three? We read there um, uh, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we see these things. Now, of course, there are other things we can do. That's the principle. If you were to go to verse 12, we read verse 12. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. We can pray. That's the enormous thing that we can do. We can cry to God. We can pray about the godly ceasing for the faithless, faithful fail among the children of men. We see these things and we can pray about it. In verses 2, 3, and 4, we can speak about these things and we can uphold those who... Who, who are fainting. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbour. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. We can point out that these things shall ultimately be judged. Uh, verse 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, or those who are downcast and oppressed and poor and suffering. Well, the Lord is so gracious. The Lord is so tender. The Lord is so kind-hearted. He is full of compassion for the sighing of the needy. He hears our sighs and he will in due course arise. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. We are safe. Even if they take our lives, we are safe. For we shall be ushered straight into the kingdom of God. They cannot remove us from the purposes, good purposes of God towards us. Their mighty boasts and their mighty dealings are but puffs of wind from him that puffeth at him. And verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. Here is something we can do. We can constantly revert to the word of God, constantly look to the word of God to strengthen us. A silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Well, I've wanted to concentrate mainly on the 11th Psalm, but there were just a few very practical points there in in Psalm 12 that we can pray, that we can uphold one another, that we can take comfort in the goodness of the Lord if we do feel oppressed, that we can have constant recourse to the words of the Lord and that we can have those great promises that he will keep us from the generation forever. Well, may the Lord bless us and help us and may the Lord have mercy on this poor and needy land. Amen. We're going to turn for our final hymn to hymn number 491. My soul triumphant in the Lord 
shall tell its joys abroad and march with holy vigour 